Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Paul Salam. I'm one of the physical therapists upstairs here at Southeastern Orthopedics. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to our symposium tonight on scapular dyskinesis, looking at conservative and surgical treatment approaches. Just to kind of give you a forecast of how it's going to flow tonight with the presentations, um, Carrie Smith is going to be talking first. She's one of the other physical therapists uh, upstairs with us. And she's going to be talking on the pathoanatomy and kinematics of the scapula. Then Dr. Spear is going to talk about uh, surgical treatment approaches and considerations for scapular-based pain. And I'm going to follow that up with uh, evaluation and treatment approaches for scapular dyskinesis, um, pretty heavy on the evidence-based uh, stuff. So that should take us to around 8 or a little after, and then we're going to open up for a question and answer or just general discussion to get uh, some feedback from you folks and just open it up for, for general discussion about scapular dyskinesis or, or shoulder things in general. Um, so without further ado, I'll have Carrie come up. All right, so um, as Paul said, um, Tonight, I'm just going to be talking about the, um, the anatomy and physiology of the scapula and the associated joints um, and talk about the normal motion of the scapula and then go into abnormal motion of the scapula and also talk about how um, various shoulder pathologies contribute to um, abnormal motion of the scapula and, uh, and vice versa. So first, a brief review of the anatomy. Of course, we're all very well versed in this. So um, on the scapula, of course, we have the uh, glenoid fossa, or for its contribution to the glenohumeral joint, um, the acromion and uh, its attachment to the clavicle, the acromioclavicular joint, the coracoid process with its uh, ligaments, and then also muscular attachments that will be relevant. Uh, we'll talk about those. And then the anterior surface of the scapula, um, forming the scapulothoracic joint. Uh, the, the muscle attachments at the scapula, we can divide up into three different groups. Uh, first, the stabilizing muscles of the scapula, so the trapezius, rhomboid, serratus anterior, and uh, the levator scapula. Then the intrinsic muscles, uh, the rotator cuff muscles, uh, with their attachment at the scapula and then also at the head of the humerus. And then the extrinsic muscles, the, the main uh, arm and, and shoulder movers. The clavicle plays a very crucial role in the function of the scapula. It acts as the, um, the piece that connects the scapula, the bony structure uh, of the, <coughs> the scapula, to the rest of the body. And um, this, of course, is at the acromioclavicular um, joint. Um, <clears throat> at the AC joint, this, uh, this allows for uh, both voluntary and accessory motion of the uh, scapula along the thoracic wall. And we'll talk about these in a little bit more detail. The resting position of the scapula is one of a slight upward rotation, um, anterior tilt, and internal rotation. <clears throat> At the scapula, there are both voluntary and accessory motions that occur. So the voluntary motions um, along the thoracic wall, uh, the uh, scapula thoracic joint, would be elevation and depression, and then also protraction and retraction around the thoracic wall. The accessory joint motion occurring at the AC and the um, SC joints uh, would be upward and downward rotation, um, anterior and posterior tilt, and internal and external rotation. So the scapula plays a number of roles, um, particularly as the arm is being elevated. So number one, the um, scapula, it, it's important to provide a stable base for the periscapular muscles. Um, the rotator cuff uh, requires a stable base um, for its anchor um, as it's uh, stabilizing the glenohumeral joint. Um, also, the in order for the um, uh, the glenohumeral joint to have maximum uh, congruency, as the arm is being elevated, the scapula must change its position. So um, as the arm is elevated, the scapula must rotate uh, externally and then also posteriorly tilt. 
the, uh, as the arm is being elevated, the greater tuberosity of the humerus comes uh, into a close approximation with the um, inferior surface of the acromion. So uh, in order to avoid impingement, uh, the acromion must uh, move out of the way. So the scapula upwardly rotates, posteriorly tilts, and externally rotates. The scapula is also a very important link in the kinetic chain so that uh, the ground, the forces that are transmitted up through the ground uh, are um, uh, to uh, provide for uh, motion of the arm, the, the scapula provides a link uh, in, this, in this chain. <clears throat> so we're all pretty well aware of the scapula humeral rhythm, um, whereby for every um, two degrees of glenohumeral motion, there is uh, one degree of scapulothoracic upward rotation. All right, so at the um, acromioclavicular and the sternoclavicular joints, uh, these provide uh, accessory motions uh, during humeral elevation. So at the AC joint, we have uh, upward rotation, <clears throat> posterior tilt, and uh, both internal and external rotation. There is uh, there's some the values in the literature are a little bit variable with respect to the rotation. Um, initially, uh, there's some internal scapular uh, rotation, and then as the arm is elevated, uh, external rotation uh, takes over. And in particular, after uh, 90 degrees of elevation, there's uh, more external rotation that takes place. At the SC joint, uh, the clavicle actually elevates, retracts, and posteriorly rotates as the arm is being elevated. So the muscles that control um, and stabilize the scapula act in a force couple. So this is analogous to a revolving door. The scapula rotates around a pivot point, and the muscles that control it, the upper trapezius mm -hmm. and the rhomboids, act to counteract the force of the serratus and the lower trapezius. The serratus uh, anterior is our main protractor of the scapula. We know this through uh, EMG studies where um, the uh, serratus is highly active um, with the protraction. <clears throat> it's important uh, as an upward rotator of the scapula uh, coupled with the, uh, the trapezius, and it provides stabilization so that uh, it prevents winging, winging of the medial border of the scapula and also um, prevents uh, the prominence of the inferior angle that we sometimes see. <clears throat> The trapezius, of course, we divide it up into its three different components. The upper trapezius, with its attachment at the clavicle, uh, is most active during initial elevation. Um, the middle trapezius is an important retractor of the scapula and counteracts the strong protraction force of the serratus anterior. And the lower trapezius is uh, most active during late phase elevation and uh, it uh, assists with upward rotation and then also plays a role in stabilizing the scapula during lowering of the arm as well. The rhomboids uh, provide a retraction force, again, to counteract that strong uh, protraction force of the serratus anterior. This position of scapular retraction is vital for correct rotator cuff function. Um, in order for the rotator cuffs to uh, behave optimally uh, and, and be at their strongest, the scapula needs to actually be retracted. All right, so sort of gone through the normal motion of the scapula, so let's talk a little bit now about what happens when things go wrong, when there's abnormal motion. So we call this abnormal motion dyskinesia, uh, and this can occur with either voluntary or accessory motions at the joint. Scapular winging is a term that we use to describe either uh, static abnormality, uh, dynamic uh, abnormality with the motion, and then and also a combination of the two. So typically with static winging, we see a prominence of the medial border of the scapula. And dynamically, we see uh, a prominence of the inferior angle, there can also be early upward translation as the arm is being elevated. And then also, uh, you can also see a rapid downward uh, rotation. There's many different causes for scapular dyskinesis, and we're going to go through those now. Uh, nerve damage, which can cause muscular weakness, so that can disrupt the force couples around uh, with the periscapular muscles. And then muscle imbalance with weaknesses or overactivity. Uh, soft tissue tightness, and then also various shoulder pathologies. <clears throat> 
uh, in the literature, the, the values for um, various uh, angles of the scapula um, as the arm is either being elevated or in a static position, it can be um, highly variable. And the reason for this, uh, there's, there's many different reasons. Um, it's difficult to measure these angles uh, in, in these studies, mainly because a lot of studies use uh, electromagnetic sensors that are uh, placed on the skin. So there's a certain degree of skin artifact that comes into play and creates a little bit of error when any of these measurements are taken. Uh, in addition to that, uh, sometimes MRIs are used uh, to measure the exact uh, position of the scapula, but of course these are commonly done in a supine position, so uh, the effect of gravity doesn't really come into play like it does in our everyday lives. Uh, and then also uh, sometimes uh, when we are presented with a patient or a subject and they have shoulder pain, but also scapular dyskinesis, sometimes we don't know which caused the other, so um, sort of a chicken and the egg effect. All right, so with uh, nerve damage, typically we think about long thoracic nerve uh, damage, and of course this innervates the serratus anterior. So this muscle can become weak uh, and cause a, uh, an imbalance in that force couple. So there will be a reduction in upward rotation of the scapula. And also we can see that, uh, that static position of the winging of the scapula. Um, also, it, with dynamic motion, as the deltoid acts to elevate the, the humerus, the, the pulling of the deltoid can actually uh, cause that medial border of the scapula to wing if there is no strong serratus uh, force to counteract that. So muscle imbalances can also cause uh, dyskinesis, so this can just be through weakness itself uh, of the serratus anterior, but then also overactivity. So the, um, commonly we see upper trapezius being overly active, uh, and this causes uh, an uh, elevation of the scapula that accommodates for maybe a loss of humeral elevation. Uh, posture comes into play uh, with the scapula and its motion as well. Um, we commonly see this rounded shoulders posture in a lot of our patients, uh, and this can be attributed sometimes to uh, pec minor <coughs> tightness. Uh, it's seen uh, with, uh, with tightness in pec minor that the scapula is actually pulled anteriorly um, and, and uh, internally rotated as well. Thoracic kyphosis can cause an abnormality in scapular motion. Uh, with an excessive rounding of that thoracic wall, the, uh, the, the we'll see a loss of upward rotation uh, and posterior tilt, but then an increase in internal rotation and elevation. <clears throat> Commonly with our overhead athletes, um, sometimes we see posterior shoulder tightness, um, and this can be expressed through uh, an internal rotation deficit at the glenohumeral joint. Because of this uh, tightness in the posterior part of the glenohumeral joint, um, as the, um, the athlete is going through the follow-through phase of their throw, as the arm is being adducted across the body, because of that tightness in the posterior shoulder, the scapula can actually be protracted around the thoracic wall. <clears throat> Uh, and one study that was done, uh, it was published in JOSPT in 2006 um, by Boric et al. Um, they looked at asymptomatic uh, overhead athletes, uh, and they um, identified a group that had uh, this internal rotation deficit, and then they also had a control group. Um, they uh, measured... They elevated passively the arm into both flexion and then also into abduction. And in both of these positions, they measured, they looked at uh, internal rotation of the glenohumeral joint and measured the uh, scapular motion uh, at this time, at the end range of motion. And they found that in the group with this internal rotation deficit, that they actually had um, an increase in anterior tilt of the scapula. So both of these things, both protraction and then an increase in anterior tilt of the scapula, can cause a decrease in the subacromial space, which then puts that person at risk for impingement. So even though these, these uh, subjects in both of these cases were asymptomatic, down the road they may potentially develop some sort of impingement. Uh, with rotator cuff um, pathology, 
we will sometimes see a compensatory increase in upward rotation of the scapula. And uh, this has been uh, shown to be uh, due to weakness in the rotator cuff muscles. Uh, McCulley et al. published a study in 2006 uh, in clinical uh, biomechanics, and what they did was they took a, a group of healthy uh, subjects and they looked at their scapular motion and recorded those mm -hmm. values. Then what they did was they uh, used a lidocaine injection to block the suprascapular nerve. So the supraspinatus and infraspinatus were weak. Um, and in the study, they used uh, they only included subjects who demonstrated a 50% reduction in these rotator cuff muscles following the injection. What they found was uh, when that uh, when those muscles were weaker, that those subjects demonstrated a, uh, an increase in upward rotation of the scapula as a compensation mechanism. Another thing that uh, would affect the rotator cuff is uh, the any time when there is a, a protraction of the scapula, any of these uh, other reasons that have caused a protraction of the scapula, uh, we'll see a reduction in rotator cuff strength. So it's been reported as up to a 23% reduction in rotator cuff strength just because of that, um, the loss of that retracted position. In our uh, folks with adhesive capsulitis, there is a loss of glenohumeral motion. So in order to compensate for um, their inability maybe to reach uh, overhead, high overhead into maybe a cabinet, uh, what we'll see is an increase in scapulothoracic motion. Um, there's really been no difference um, documented in the literature uh, regarding tilt or rotation, but we, but we do see this uh, <clears throat> uh, upward rotation increase. With uh, various changes in scapular motion, um, these, uh, these changes can lead to subacromial impingement, which I've sort of talked to uh, already. Um, there is a decrease in upward rotation, an increase in anterior tilt, and an increase in internal rotation. All of these things collectively can cause protraction around that thoracic wall, decreasing the subacromial space, causing more impingement and also then weakening the rotator cuff. As a compensatory strategy, sometimes uh, these uh, people with uh, subacromial impingement will actually overcompensate for uh, this, uh, the pain that they're having uh, in the subacromial space. So uh, they will, their upward rotation will increase more than normal and they will demonstrate an increase in posterior tilt. All of these things will then allow for a little bit more space uh, subacromially, uh, which reduces the compression on the rotator cuff tendons. With an AC joint separation, we would see a loss of that, the strut of the clavicle. So uh, the um, scapula actually uh, slides a little bit downward along that thoracic wall, and uh, then it's allowed to sort of protract and internally rotate around the thoracic wall. Because of this protracted position, then we see that subsequent uh, reduction in rotator cuff strength. Similarly, with a clavicle fracture, you have that loss of the strut, a protraction of the scapula, and a weakening of the rotator cuff. Uh, in people that we see with uh, scapular dyskinesis, they are often at a higher risk for labral injury. Um, this sort of goes back to our the glenohumeral internal rotation deficit. Uh, because of this um, protraction uh, as the arm is being adducted across the body during a, a throwing motion, there's an increased amount of force on the posterior and superior labrum, so it sets it up for a uh, risk for injury down the road. And finally, uh, with multidirectional instability, um, the resting position of the scapula is altered so that there is a, it's slightly downwardly rotated, um, and uh, there's also a change in the muscle activation pattern. So uh, an increase in pec minor and in the lats, uh, but a reduction in uh, the lower trapezius and serratus anterior activity. So these, this really disrupts our, the force couples around the, uh, the scapula. And during arm elevation, we'll see a decrease in upward rotation and then uh, an increase in internal rotation.